everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be looking at the in game, king and pawn in game. Probably the most common in game that you'll see. Uh, many times players will evaluate in their game to come to this point and see if a game is won or drawn. And some of your top level games, you'll see players resign far in advance because they've come to this conclusion in their head. Um, but if you're not a GM, then we want to go ahead and know both sides is your white how to win and if you're black how to defend correctly so that if white's not playing correctly that you can force a draw in this position. Uh, in this position if it's white's turn it's actually a winning game. If it's black's turn it's actually a drawn game and we're going to go over that. Uh, first we're going to go over if it's white's turn and kind of the key concepts that he needs to be looking at. Now a lot of times White will completely mess this up. Um, people know that they need to get their king involved to protect this pawn, so they will go ahead and bring in their king to the d3 square. Unfortunately, this is now a drawn game. Um, what can happen is black can go ahead and come down to d5, and this is a key concept in king and pawn endgame, that if the kings are two spaces between each other, and it's white's turn, it's actually a drawn game. Um, if it's a black's turn, white still has the advantage and can easily win if played correctly. But in this position, uh, since it's white's turn, it's a drawn game. White play can continue. Um, king to c3, black is just going to mare. He can always move to b3, mare. If he ever tries to go back, he can mare. Um, he can always try to advance his pawn. Black king can just follow the pawn all the way up the board to the c8 square um, and if it, it's eventually going to be a drawn game there's nothing the white can do um, so as we see early on although it looks like winning position it should be pretty easy you need very good tactics so as we talked about before if the kings are two spaces between each other and it's black's move or excuse me if it's white's move it's a drawn game so we want there to be two spaces and it's black's turn so our first move is actually going to be d4 Okay, we are protecting our pawn, but we're two spaces, and it's Black's turn. So Black's going to go ahead and move to c6. Obviously, Black can always play terrible and move away and just make sure win a little easier. But um, if you play correctly, as you should, if you are Black, keep in mind if you are Black, you should be studying this as well. Uh, White's going to go ahead and move to c4. Again, we want two spaces in between, and it to be Black's move for a winning position here. So in this position, we are aligned with our pawn. We're two spaces between. Now whichever way the king moves we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to go in the opposite direction. Okay, So let's say that black moves to b6. We are actually going to move up and occupy the d5 square. Okay, Now black should go ahead and move to d6. Um, obviously he can run away but it will just make things a little easier. And we're going to go ahead and repeat the same thing that we did before. We're going to go ahead and move to c5. Again, same position, just one step farther. And whichever way he moves, we're going to do the same thing. So if he moves to d7, we're going to go ahead and occupy the b6 square. And he can go ahead and come to uh, the c8 square. And right now, we're not as concerned with the two space rule because we're going to go ahead and start moving our pawn. But that will come into play in just a minute here. Um, we're going to go ahead and promote our pawn here to c4 square and black's going to go ahead and move to the b8 square now technically on the uh, we are two spaces but again we're still moving our pawn so we're going to go ahead and move our pawn one space and now black moves and now we're going to do the same thing as before we're going to go ahead and come to the c6 square two spaces and now it's black's turn and now whichever way he goes we are going to take the opposite direction. Now keep in mind if this is not played correctly uh, if white tries to just keep promoting his pawn here uh, black can easily get a stalemate draw out of this. So keep this in mind if, as you, if you're black um, if white doesn't play correctly it's a pretty pretty easy draw for black. So uh, black is forced to play either b8 or uh, d8 doesn't matter both will be the same result let's say b8 now same theme as before white's going to go ahead and come to the d7 square uh, black can no longer come to the c file and white's going to easily promote his pawn to the c8 square and make a queen so as we'll see here um, let's say king to b7 um, 
pawn to c6, and king cannot come to uh, c7 or c8 in the next two moves. Um, we will have a queen. If you really want to rub it in, you can make a rook, but in all cases, you're going to win the game fairly easy. We're going to go ahead and take a look at another position here and go over just another key concept and just look at if the pawn is on the B or G file here. Um, but clearly we looked at the last one and saw that White can early on take a winning ad advantage and make it into a draw if he's not careful. And we'll see that here too. Um, it goes over another key concept. If White moves to D2, Black can just come to D6 and it's a draw in the game. And the reason is they are four spaces between each other and it's White's move. Um, in the last example we touched on if they're two spaces in, four is no different only because any time White wants to come up to the third rank, um, Black can respond and just mirror and come to the fifth rank. And now they are two spaces between. So um, it's, if it's four spaces or two spaces and it's White's turn, Black has the advantage. Um, and the same thing if there are two spaces or four spaces and it's black's turn, then white has the advantage. So just keep those things in mind if you're on the offense or the defense. So we're going to go ahead and play as you should um, and just give you another example of how it should look. So we're going to come E2. Black's going to go ahead and try to come in the mix with D6. And we're going to move to F3. Again, black king can't come two or four spaces between us, but black is going to try to come into the mix. We're going to go ahead and keep going as far as we can to the G4 square. Black's going to continue his run to the F6 square, and just as if it was black's move and he went from G6 uh, to F6, we're going to go ahead and take this H5 square. Now black's going to go ahead and uh, try to retreat to the H8 corner. That's his best bet of drawing a um, a stalemate or a draw, so he's going to come to the G7 square, and we're going to just repeat the same process. We're going to come to the G5 square, and whichever place he goes, we're going to go the opposite. So um, if he comes to the F7 square, we're just going to drop here to the H6 square, and then Black's going to retreat to the H8 square, and then we're going to simply bring up our pawn um, and promote and win the game. So we'll go ahead and play that out. Black will go ahead and just go to the corner and we will go ahead and bring our pawn and Black can go ahead and continue to um, bring this up and just as before um, we're going to use the same tactic that we always have. We're going to go ahead and move here and we're two spaces between and it's Black's turn to move. Whichever way he doesn't go we're going to go. So he's probably going to go to the h8 square, and we're going to go ahead and move our king to the f7 square. Now his king only has one spot to go, so it's going to go to the um, h7 square. We're going to go ahead and start promoting our pawn here and put him in check, and he's going to continue to retreat to the h8 square, and we're going to put him in check, and the only place he has to go is the h7 square, and we can easily promote to a queen and from here go on to easily win the game. So um, hope this has helped as far as learning how the King Pawn in game works. If you ever find it in your own games you will now be equipped to win pretty easy. If you do want some some practice you can actually visit my website where I've set up um, a few boards where you can play in different positions. That's thechesswebsite.com. It's also on my YouTube page. You can check that out. Um, but go there, check it out. It's under in game and king and pawn and you'll see a couple puzzles there but hope you enjoyed hope you learned a lot please subscribe to the videos so you know when new ones are coming out I'm gonna be having a lot of videos coming out in the near future so hope you enjoyed and see y'all next video everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com today we're gonna be going over the two bishop in game for white and how to checkmate the king um, if you haven't studied this before, this would be a very good opportunity to learn um, different techniques and even more so than just checkmate the king, just learn how the bishops can work together well uh, when attacking. You can use this if there are more pieces on the board. But if you just have two bishops, we're going to go ahead and get into it and show you um, how to go about it. So first thing you want to do, um, now keep in mind as we go over this video, there are many, many different ways to checkmate the king 
And no, I'm actually not going to be showing you the fastest way. Um, I'm going to show you the easiest way. So if you can figure out how to do it a faster way and you want to do that, that's fine. But I'm going to go over what I think is the easiest way. So um, starts out, I like to centralize my king first um, and then get the bishops nearby next to each other um, and then I basically just like to push the king back, push the king back and checkmate. So we'll see how that looks here. Uh, white moves first, white's just going to move up here and black king is going to um, move as well, b5 really doesn't matter where he moves and I'm going to go ahead and centralize my king here at d4 and black's king is going to go ahead and move back and I'm going to go ahead and centralize my first bishop. Again, this is a key concept. Centralizing your bishops, um, activating your king nearby, and then pushing the king back. So uh, black's going to go ahead and move, and I'm going to go ahead and activate this bishop here. As you can see, this bishop, this white bishop, is taking away this long diagonal on the um, A to H file. Um, and so the black king is limited now to these green squares that I have highlighted. So he's going to have to go ahead and go that route. So you can already see the limited space that the black king has. Um, so he's going to go ahead and move, um, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and move our white bishop here um, and see where the black king goes. The black king could come to um, f6, and then we could go ahead and drop our bishop back. Uh, still limiting more moves that the black king can do, but uh, black king is going to go ahead and move to f7, and we're going to go ahead and stick with what we've been doing, and that's moving the bishops next to each other, so um, limiting more squares. And as you'll see, key concept, when this, these two bishops are next to each other, uh, the entire rank right above it, the king cannot come down. So this sixth rank here, the king cannot pass, and so we are um, really taking away squares that the king can go to and we have not moved very much. So we're going to go ahead and can you continue. Black king has to move to one of those squares and he moves. Um, and now we really don't have any good moves for the bishop so we're going to go ahead and start to activate our king a little bit more. And black king has to retreat. And we're going to go ahead and bring our king to a better position. And black king is forced to move back. Um, this long diagonal and he couldn't come here because of our king and so now we're going to do our first check. We're going to go ahead and move our white bishop here. He um, can come back to F um, F8 or he can move to D8. Those are his two moves. If he does decide to go D8, we'll take a look at that. Um, or if he moves to f8, it'll be more the same. We will move our bishop here, and he'll be confined to even less space. But uh, if he does decide to move to um, d8, then we are going to simply do the same move as if we would gone to g8. We're going to go ahead and move our bishop to f6, and this limits the black king to one space. He can only move to this c8 square. Our bishops have cut off these moves, and again, he can't move... Um, this rank here because of our king. So uh, black king is have to move to c8 square. And now we're going to go ahead and move our king. We're going to go and activate him, use him a little bit more. And again, since we have this bishop on this diagonal, this, the king is again limited to only one space. Um, so black king is going to move there. And we are going to continue our activation of our king. Now, the black king can move either place, A or C. Either way, he's going to have the same fate. Um, so pretty much the same moves are going to happen. If he moves to um, A8, then we're going to a slow move. We're not going to put him in check yet, but we're going to go ahead and put our bishop here on um, F5, limiting to this B8 square, getting ready for a two move checkmate so he black is forced to this b8 square and now we can pretty much use both of our bishops uh, first move is going to be this e to e5 square uh, forcing him back to the a8 square now notice if we didn't put our our light square bishop here earlier then the black king could retreat back to this c8 square but since he was nicely placed here 
uh, the black king is forced to retreat to this square um, and then the light square bishop is going to come down and checkmate him so that's obviously if he goes to the left to the d8 square we're going to go ahead and take a look if um, black decides to move to the f8 square and again like I said before we're going to go ahead and continue what we've been doing we're going to bring up our bishop to the f6 square and block off the king's mobility black king now has two moves or two spaces he can move to only one he can move to but uh, two available squares and so he's going to be forced to go to the g8 square and from here we're going to go ahead and like we've always done we're going to activate our king get him alongside the bishop as you can recall from the very early uh, moves we actually had this same setup and we've actually just moved this setup down the board getting the king closer and closer to checkmate so uh, king only has one move uh, because of the bishops he's going to have to go back to f8 and when he moves back to f8 now we can start um, we have a great position we can go ahead and start getting our bishops in range and you can go ahead and just conceptually think about what we're doing here we're going to go ahead and move this bishop back um, we eventually want them to checkmate him much like we did al along the a8 square um, and this little subtle move the black king still only has one place he can go and that's the g8 square so that's very important and so he's going to move there and our king is going to go ahead and take the place of that bishop again we don't want this uh, king to be able to move on the seventh rank so we want to go ahead and take his place uh, bishop is taking off this h7 square and the king is taking the rest of these uh, black can choose to go either f8 or h8 doesn't matter the same fate will be brought upon him um, we'll go ahead and look at f8 here and now we're going to go ahead and bring this bishop into a better position go ahead and check the king the black king has to move to the g8 square um, and same move if he would have gone to h8 we would still bring this bishop here and he would just go from h8 to g8 same fate like I said before black king is going to go ahead and move to g8 and now we're going to go ahead and get our other light square bishop into the action so he's just going to drop back one f5 and the black king is forced to go to h8 and we are going to go ahead and like we did with the dark squared bishop we're going to go ahead and take the place of our light squared bishop with our king here so again he cannot move along this seventh rank and the black king is forced to move along um, the eighth rank on the g8 square his only move so he's going to move to the g8 square and then much like we had on the other side it's a very easy win from here white's going to go ahead and move his light squared bishop check black is forced into the corner and white can go ahead and come down with his dark square bishop and checkmate the king so hopefully you all enjoy this video um, like I said before there are very very many ways to checkmate the the king with two bishops I feel like this is the easiest um, if you do want some practice you can actually check on my website I have a few variations where you can go and actually practice playing against a computer with two bishops and that website is www.thechesswebsite.com and you can just click on in game two bishops and practice there so hope you guys enjoyed definitely subscribe so you know when new videos are coming out a lot more should be posted shortly and have a good one hey everyone this is kevin from the chesswebsite.com and today we're going to be looking at a tricky ending and that is the rook versus the knight now obviously in this case there's no way for black to win which is simply a knight but White usually has a hard time winning a game with Rook and Knight. But we are going to go over what White should do and how Black should defend. Now, as you can tell from this example, if it's White's move, White can simply move King 2, G2, and the Knight's going to be lost. There's no way the Knight can move to get out of the way of harm. And he's going to be captured, and it's going to be a pretty easy end game for White. More times than not, it's not going to be that easy. So we're going to take a look at some other examples and see just how hard it can be. But by the end of this, you're going to know exactly how to do it. Let's go and take a look at another example here. And as you can see, our rook is being attacked by the king. Now I have all these colors out here, so you can take a look. If the knight is in one of these red squares here around, then there's a great chance that you're going to win this. This is really where you want the knight to be. If his knight is here, you can usually win. If his knight is in the yellow, you have 
a good chance, but not as great as if it's in the red. Now, if you allow the knight to get into the squares in the middle, then the game, for the most part, is going to be drawn, unless there's incorrect play by either of the sides. So from here, the rook is being attacked by white. A lot of times, you may someone see someone try to get their rook out of harm's way by moving something like e8, trying to get his rook out of the way, saying that later on he'll attack the knight. This is actually going to be a drawn game. If black plays correctly, this is going to be a drawn game. And white has lost his initiative and the game itself. He would have won, and now he's going to draw. So let's go ahead and take a look at what white should have done. What white should have done, and what you need to think about in a rook versus knight endgame, is you want to limit the squares that the knight can go to. So in this case, our best move is just simply rook to e3. You can already see that we've taken away all the squares that the black knight can go to. a3, c3, and d2. Even if the black king tries to come and attack us again, we can simply move to b3, and we've taken away all the squares the knight can go to, and we're attacking him as well. On the next move, we're going to take the knight, and then it's simply a king and rook endgame, which is much easier than trying to figure out how to win. This right here is a clear win from white after we take the knight. So let's go ahead and take a look at a few more examples and see how we can take this rook and knight in game and turn it into a win for white. Let's go ahead and take a look at another example here. And go ahead, it's white's move. Go ahead and take a minute to see if in your head you can figure out where white should go. So if you need to pause it, figure out where you think white should go, that he'll win here. And I hope you came up with the move rook to f8 and what this does is it takes away all the squares that the knight can go. The knight can't go to f7 can't go to f5 and he can't go to rook to g8. So from here the black king is going to move to d6 now take a minute again and think about where you think white should move and hopefully you came up with the simple move rook to f6 forking the knight. The king is going to have to move and then we can simply take the knight here on h6 and then it's just simply a king and rook in game versus the king which is a pretty easy win for white. Now if you thought about something like king to g5 the black king can simply come to e7 attacking our rook and this is actually going to be a drawn game. There's nothing white can do if black plays correctly to win this game. So hopefully you're seeing it a little bit clear. Let's go ahead and take a look at one more example and hopefully that'll ingrain it a little bit more into your brain. Let's go ahead and take a look at this example here and take a minute and pause the video if you want to and see where you think White should move to make sure that he has a winning game here. And hopefully you just came up with Rook to D5. Obviously, right away, the knight could not come to c5 or e5 because our rook was attacking it. But we want to limit the squares he can go to. And the only squares he can go to, we're attacking it, so he has to move our f8 and f6. And it doesn't matter which one he moves to now, because then we can simply come to rook to f5 and fork the knight here. Once the king moves, then we're going to take the knight here. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. Hopefully you all have learned something. If you do come to an end game and you see a rook and knight, look at where the knight is in relationship to the rest of the board. And if he is on the outer rim, then more than likely you're going to have a winning end game. So take this and if you ever do come across it, now you'll know how to turn this slight advantage into a victory. If you haven't already, please subscribe and I'll see you guys next video. Thanks for watching everybody. Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be looking at another in game scenario that deals with the bishop and knight. Uh, this is probably one of the most difficult in games that you'll come across. It's not too common, but it's definitely one of the in games that you'll want to know how to do. Uh, it's very good to study just to know how the bishop and the knight work together as well. Um, keep in mind while we go over this video, uh, no end game is going to be exactly the same, so while I'm going to give you specific moves, don't try necessarily to memorize the moves. Instead, try to understand conceptually what I'm doing and how the pieces move together so that when you do play, uh, if your opponent moves correctly or incorrectly, you'll be able to take advantage and checkmate the Black King with under 50 moves if uh, the moves 
does reach 50, it's actually a drawn game. So you need to know how to do it um, pretty quickly. So we're going to go ahead and get started here and go over um, some key concepts. Now the first thing we want to look at is this bishop. Um, it's a dark squared bishop and that means that eventually the only way to checkmate the king is if we can get the king down to uh, one of these corners, either the h8 or the a1 corner. Um, we can checkmate him on the a1 or the um, b1 square, but he's going to have to come to one of these corners. As black, he's going to try to spend all his time um, on the opposite corners. So keep that in mind. Um, another key concept you'll see is we don't check the king very much until the very end. Um, we're actually just trying to surround the king, force him to go a specific way, um, kind of block off his moves from retreating from us, and then at the very end we will launch our attack on him. So um, the worst thing you can do is just try to check the king as much as you can. Um, it's really not going to do you any good. So um, obviously in any end game you want to activate your king early and often and use him um, because he can make a blockade. Um, pretty much anywhere he is against the opponent's king. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at this position and the first thing we're going to do is our king is way away from where we want him to be. So we're going to go ahead and activate our king here. We're going to go ahead and move him to e2. And black king is going to move to d7. Doesn't really matter right now where he goes. He's just trying to run around and have a draw game after 50 moves. We're going to go and continue up the board with our king, get him more active. Um, black is going to move c6 and we're going to continue just chasing after him to d4 and white, black can continue to move. Um, now black obviously does not want to move towards a1. He's going to checkmate himself a lot faster um, than he wants to. So if he plays correctly, as you should if you are defending, you're eventually going to want to come to the a8 square then if you can dance around back to the h1 square um, but if he starts coming to the a1 square you'll see with some of the concepts we're going over um, he can lose very quickly so uh, more than likely he's gonna go the other way um, but first we're gonna go ahead and activate our knight here uh, we've already got our king into the mix and so our knight was over here wasn't doing anything so we're gonna go ahead and bring him into the game doesn't really matter which one which way you bring him into the game, but we're going to go ahead and bring him to the e3 square. And black's going to go ahead and continue up here to the corner where we can't checkmate him, um, but that's okay. We'll, we'll eventually deal with him. So he goes to b6. And we're going to go ahead and start to bring our king up the board. Eventually we want to get our, our king to the c6 square. So the faster we can get to the c6 square, the better. Um, black, like I said before, is going to continue up the board here and now our bishop's starting to um, get out of the action so we're going to go ahead and bring our bishop into the action and we're going to start taking away some squares uh, these blue squares or purple um, are squares that he can't go to so he's got to move somewhere else he can't dance around this way uh, it doesn't really matter which um, di or excuse me um, column he goes if he goes towards this eight h square or the a1 square it doesn't really matter we're just trying to get our bishop active here um, let's see where black goes black goes to b6 so that is not a problem at all we're gonna go ahead and activate our knight a little closer into the game so he's in the action and this is a check even though it's it's not a check to make the king move it's a check just to get the knight into the action here so um, that is why that move was made and the black's going to retreat to his um, A8 corner. And we're going to start to move our pieces a little farther. We're going to go ahead and move our king a little closer to the action so he can't come down. And you've already started to see that we've started to block off some squares for black. Um, our knight is um, blocking off some squares. We have our bishop activated. And so we've started already um, on only our eighth move. Um, we've already brought about a very good position and so we're going to go ahead and continue here. Black's going to go ahead and just move back. He right now is in no serious threat. He's in the A8 corner. And 
and now our king is on the c6 squared. Now, obviously, on other sides of the board, it's going to be different, but um, in this case, the c6 square is a very crucial um, spot for the king at the beginning. Now, depending on where the black king goes, it can change, but very crucial square, and you can already see that we've started to block off a lot of different squares. Uh, the black king can only go to a8 and a6 now. So he's going to go ahead and go to the a8 square, his trusted square. And we're going to go ahead and bring our knight to b6. And I got a lot of visuals up here. Uh, you really want to, I find it the easiest way, is to have your, um, your king on c6 or this square, wherever it is on the board, c3 or f3. Um, or f6 and you want to have your knight right next to him it's a little easier to maneuver as you can see um, we eventually want to just march this king all the way down to the a1 square that is the best square that we can get him to and we don't want him um, if we have our knight here on b6 we want to bring him here if we had our knight on um, c6 we'd want to bring him to the h8 square but since we want to bring him down here, we have our bishop knightly, nicely positioned on the um, e5 square, attacking the b8 square. So the king cannot come here. He can't come to the b7 square because of our king. And so he's going to have to march down this file right here. And we're going to show you how to do that. So as you can see, his only move is a7. So he's going to go ahead and move there. And now we don't want the king to come back here. Um, our knight and king are nicely placed right now. So we're just going to go ahead and improve our bishop for a second. And we're going to go ahead and move him to um, c7. Uh, it's kind of the same setup as before. He can pretty much move to the same squares. He can't go back to the a8 because of our knight. So he's going to have to continue marching down the board here like we want him to. And now we want to stop him from retreating back to the a8 square. Um, and we have our knight and king nicely placed, so we're actually going to move our bishop and block off this a7 square. So his only move is the a5 square. As you can see, we forced pretty much every move all the way down this file so far. So king has to move to a5, um, which he does. And now a very important move, uh, one that if you haven't studied this, um, in game it's going to be pretty tough for you to catch and we actually from here want to activate our knight and get him into the action our bishop is keeping him from coming back but we want <clears throat> we do not want the king to make his way down to the h1 square and so we're going to block off some squares um, with our knight and that's going to be um, knight to d5 like I said before we don't want him to get to the h1 square and this subtle move right here blocks off some of the squares that the king can go to. Uh, the knight's blocking off this b4 and c3, and the king has this b5 um, blocked off. So um, he is going to have to have a longer um, track to the h1 square. So we're going to go ahead and follow. Uh, black king goes a4, and we're going to go ahead and continue down with our king, give a better position for our king. And the c5 square is actually the outpost for our king for a while. He is going to, black king goes a4, and we're going to go ahead and continue down with our king, give a better position for our king. And the c5 square is actually the outpost for our king for a while. He is going to kind of hang out there, and our minor pieces, the bishop and knight, are going to be doing most of the work um, for for the short while. So we're going to go ahead and see where the king goes. The king is going to try to make a fast track to the h1 square. And we are going to do what we did before, and that's activate our knight and try to take away some squares. And we're going to go to b4. And it's done for two reasons. Um, with the knight here, we're taking away two light squares, which is the c2 and the d4. Um, now the dark squares, as you're going to see in just a moment, are going to be taken away from um, from the bishop when we bring the bishop and activate him. Uh, the king can't come to the c4 square, 
because of the king, he can't come to this d4 square. Um, and so he's eventually going to have to make his way on dark squares. And so our next move is going to be to activate the bishop and make sure that he does not do this. Um, but at the time being, we've blocked off the light square so he cannot get past these. And for just a little while, we're going to actually leave our knight there so that he can't do this. We're going to see where black goes. Uh, and black comes down to b2. And black now wants to try to move along these dark squares. So his next move wants to be uh, C2. So we're actually going to stop C2. Um, a lot of people get the mistake and try to come down to E5 and check the king. Uh, but again, we're not trying to check the king. We're trying to check make the king. So we're going to come here to F4 and block off these two dark squares. And the knight, as we talked about, blocks off these light squares. And so black is not able to retreat to the h1 square. So uh, black in this situation is probably going to try to make a move back to the a1 square since we have this blocked off. Um, well, it looks like he's first going to move to the h1 square. So we're actually going to kind of just improve our position with our bishop. Um, our knight is nicely placed. He's still defending these light squares. And the black king still can't come past this wall that we've created. So we're just going to bring the bishop a little bit closer. And you can already see the wall we've created that black king cannot come against. Uh, the bishop has all of these dark squares covered. Uh, the king has this square and the knight has the two light squares. So the black king is, has to retreat now. And he retreats and we're actually going to improve our bishop one more. And just from this subtle move we've created another wall that the black king cannot come to. Uh, again, the bishop has the dark squares, the knight has this light square, and the king has this light square as well. So the king's going to have to do something. He's probably going to now retreat to the a1 square. Um, and he does. He moves to a4. And now we want to make sure that he can't come back to this a5 square. Um, and so we want to make sure that our bishop is aligned there. So we're going to go ahead and move our knight to c, excuse me, c2. Um, activate him a better position and allow for our bishop to block off these two dark squares. So the black king um, can no longer come to the a square and he's going to have to come back to this area. And he's going to come attack our knight so we know for sure we have to move our knight. We want to make sure that we put him in the best position. And black obviously would like to either take the knight or take this position from the knight and go along these light squares. So we want to move the knight where he is out of the way of harm and at the same time blocking this light squared. So we're going to actually move our knight to uh, d4, taking away this light square. And these dark squares are taken by the bishop and this light square is taken by the king. So we have another wall that the black king cannot go around. So the black king is going to try to retreat again. And now we are going to get the king involved. And we're actually just going to get our king and push the king, the black king, all the way down the line. Um, as you've seen, we already have a line on this C file. The black king cannot come past this C file because of our minor pieces. And so we're just going ahead and get our king involved. So king to b6, and black starts to retreat and we move our king into position. You can see the wall we've created of moves that he cannot make. And the black king is going to come down. Our black, or excuse me, our king is going to continue his track down to the A1 square. And we have a wall created of moves that the black king cannot make. And the black king is going to go closer. And now we can actually activate our bishop and get him into the game a little bit better. Um, close the king in. So we're going to go ahead and move our bishop to C1. Now the black king can move to a1 or b1. It doesn't matter. Our next move will be the same. And that's just going to be bishop to a3. And the bishop is blocking off uh, these two dark squares. And the knight is blocking off this c2 square. So the black king cannot come to this h1 square. He's going to have to retreat. And it doesn't matter which one he goes to. Um, we're going to go ahead and bring our um, if he comes to a2, we can move our knight first, but if he comes to a1, we can move our king first, so just keep that in mind. Um, so we're first going to go ahead and activate our king here, and black only has one move to b1. And then we're going to head and put our knight in a better position at e2. Again, the black king can't come to c1 because of the bishop and the knight now, 
So his only move is a1, and now we can finish off the king. We can check him with b2 check, and after he moves, we can move our knight and swoop in for the checkmate. So, hope this helped. I hope uh, conceptually you have a better feel for how to checkmate with the bishop and knight. Um, it's a very fun end game once you understand it. Um, if you want some practice on my website, thechesswebsite.com, you can go and under end games, you can practice under King and Knight, but uh, definitely going to be having a lot more videos, so please subscribe. Hope everyone enjoyed. Leave comments or questions for me, and hope you all enjoy. Thanks. Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com, and today we're going to be looking at lesson number two in our in game study, and it's going to be on triangulation. And so many chess games are won or lost on triangulation. I feel like it's very important to not only talk about what it is, but go over some examples so you know exactly how it's played. And what triangulation is, is a position in a chess game where if it's your opponent's move, you will have a completely winning position, but it's your position. It's your turn. So what you need to do is use triangulation, meaning you're going to make a triangle with your king's movements so that you reach the exact same position or similar and it's your opponent's move. And so that's what we're going to look at today. If you take a look at this example here, the, uh, the white king would like to come to e3, and the black king would like to come to e5. Those are going to be the critical squares. From there, the kings can pretty much control the center and then gobble up all your opponent's pawns. But in this case, it's white's move. And if white tries to capture this e3 square, the black king can come to e5. And right now, it's white's move in this position and there's nothing good that white can do. He can't come to d3 and he can't come to f3 so he's going to be pushed back and once he does the black king can come to either d4 or f4 gobble up our pawns and march his pawns down and promote to a king. So we want to reach this exact same position but we want it to be black's move because if we take a look at it in this same spot from the very beginning if it's black's move Black has nowhere to move at the beginning. He can't use triangulation because if he moves away, we can come to e3 and he can't get back to his pawn fast enough before we control the center. He can't use triangulation. His only move is to come to e5. And if he comes to e5 and we come to e3, now we have the same position, but it's Black's move. And if you look at the Black King, he can't go anywhere. He can't come to d5. He can't come to e6. He's going to be forced back to d6, and now our king can come to e4, capture, and the black king is going to be further pushed back, and we can continue to march our pawns up and have complete domination in this game. It's going to be a very easy win from white. So what we need to do from the very beginning is we need to have this position, but we need it to be black's move. So what we need to do, if it is our move, is we need to use triangulation. And we do that by first not taking the square that we want, e3. We first need to make a triangle. And you can come to d2 or f2. I'm going to move to f2. doesn't really matter. They're both going to make a triangle. And we're going to come to f2 and then try to come to e3. And we'll take a look at two things that black can do. We already take... We already saw that if his king comes to e5 right away, trying to control the center, then our king can come to e3 and we have this exact same position as before but as we saw before it's now black's move and as we talked about the black king has no good moves he's gonna have to come back to d6 and once he does once we capture it's going to be an easy game for white but if we take a look at the same example black does have another option it's very important to look at if the if the pawn comes to e3 a lot of players if black looks at this and really analyzes and realizes that his king on e5 is a mistake. So he may try a move like e3. And from here, it would actually be a mistake for white to capture on e3. Even though black is now down in material, his king can now come to e5. And if you look at it, although white's up in material by one pawn, we have the same position, but now it's white's turn. And as we talked about, this is going to be bad for white. White has no way of pushing this black king up the board. Black now has the initiative, and White's going to lose this game. So as we see, it would be bad. We really want this position, regardless of that pawn, for it to be Black's move. So in this case, it would actually be better for White to bring his king to f3. Now if the pawn continues to push up the board, then we can capture. And now if the Black King comes to e5, now we can come to e3, 
and now it's black's move. So we really want this position, like we talked about from the very beginning, but we want it to be black's move. And that's how we use triangulation. We want to create a triangle in our movements so either we reach the exact same position, but it's your opponent's move. So we're going to take a look at a few more examples of how you can use triangulation in a game. Let's go ahead and take a look at this example. And if it's white's move, black's going to have a completely dominant and winning game. The white rook cannot move to b1, or the pawn can keep continue to come down the board to b2, and we have the same position. In the same case, this pawn on g3 can't come to g4, because the black pawn can then just take it on g4, and black's going to have an easy win. In the same way, if the white king moves away from this f3 square, this black king can come to the g4 square and have a completely dominant position. Depending on where the king is, black can then push his pawn to f4, and then after the trade, the black king can take this pawn on e5. Or, if the king is, let's say, on e3, then the black king can just take on g3. And we'll take what that looks like here in a minute, but if it's white's move, black's going to have an easy game, but it's black's move. So black has to use triangulation to move to the same position, except now it's going to be white's turn. And so he's going to do that by first playing h5. He can't come to f6 because this pawn is here, and from here, white has a decision to make, and there's really nothing white can do. He can't move his pawn up to this fourth rank because of this rook here, and he doesn't want to move his king right away, and we already talked about he can't move his pawn up, so he's going to bring his rook over to h2. He's going to try to check our king and make our king move. Our king's going to just move back to g6. And from here, the rook's going to have to bring his rook back to b2. If it doesn't, then black can just bring his pawn all the way down the board. It's protected by this rook on b4, and he's going to get a queen. White's going to have to trade off his rook, and he's going to be down a rook. So white's going to have to bring back his rook to b2, and from here, black can play king to g5. And as we can see, we have the exact same position, but now it's white's move. And it doesn't matter white moves. If he brings his p king to f2, g2, or even e3, they're all going to be bad, because now the black king can come, like we talked about, to g4, the critical square. And from here, black's next move is going to be f4, or depending on where the king is, if the king moves, let's say, to e3, we already talked about. The king can now just take on g3, and it's going to be a fairly easy win for black. The king can then march up the board, take this pawn on e5, and he's going to have passed pawns, and he's going to have a fairly easy win once he promotes to a queen. So as you can see in this example, we used our king the white king didn't move around, but we still reached the exact same position, except it was our opponent's turn, and so we gained the advantage. So let's take a look at one more example in triangulation to make sure that you completely understand how it works. Let's take a look at our last position and see if you can find the triangulation from white. Now hopefully you found it, but so many people in this position, they have a completely winning end game, but they'll try to force the issue. If it's black's move, White's going to have a fairly easy win, but if it's White's move, so many times you'll see a move, White will play pawn to c6, trying to force the issue, but from here, Black can come to c8 with his, pawn, with his king, and this is going to be a drawn game. And we can play it out, but so many times, White will waste an opportunity to win because he doesn't look at it. And this, from the starting position, White really needs to use triangulation so he can get the same position, but it's Black's move. And we can do that by first playing king to e5. Now from here, if the king comes to, let's say, c6, we can now bring our king to d4. His king can't come to b5 because then we can bring our king up to d5 and basically lock off his king. He can't come back to c6. So once his king can't come to c7, once he comes back to d7, now our king is going to come to d5, and we have the same position, except now it's black's move. And now, once black brings his king to c8, then we can easily bring our king up the board and force an easy checkmate. So as you can see here, if we can force your opponent in different situations, if they have no good moves, if we can force them to have the move instead of us using triangulation, this is going to be very good. And always look out for this in your game. If you see your opponent doesn't have a good move, watch out and see if you can create it to be his move. So 
Hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you haven't already, please subscribe. i got a lot of great lessons for the end game coming up. Hope you guys enjoy, and I'll see you guys next video. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the ChessWebsite.com, and today we're going to be looking at the endgame King and Rook vs. King, and it's very similar to the King and Queen endgame as we're basically going to try to bring our Rook and minimize the squares that the Black King can go to and just continue to march our Rook up the board until the Black King is checkmated. So we'll go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. First move, we're going to move Rook to E7, and you can already see we've already limited the Black King to these three files, the F file, the G file, and the H file. So the Black King can only move in these spots. And let's say the Black King moves to G5. He's now limited his space even more. We can just bring our Rook to, to F7, and we've already now limited the King to two files, the G file and the H file. Now let's say the Black King continues and attacks our, our Rook. Obviously, we're not going to come down to the G file now. But then we can simply bring our Rook down to F1 away from the danger of the Black King's attack, and the Black King is still limited to these two files, the G file and the H file. Now obviously the Black King is going to continue to come down. If he does move back to the H file, then we can simply bring our Rook even closer and limit the moves. So more than likely you'll see the Black King start to come toward your Rook. Now we can bring our White King into the mix, and if Black continues down, now we can simply bring our rook to g1 and this is this situation right here is what you want if you ever want to force black to move back a file or a row depending on which setup you have this is kinda of what you want you want the king and the both kings looking at each other with one space in between and you want your rook bring it to the file that the king the black king is on and the black king is forced to move. He can't come to f5, f4, f3 because of the king, and he ha can't move along the g file because of the rook here. So he's forced to move back to the h file. And when he does move, you can see he's limited to the h file here because of our rook on the g file. So from here, you may see. From here, we're simply going to bring our king into the mix. Obviously, we want our king. If it's our move right here, it'd be checkmate. We go to h1. But we want to bring our king into the mix. Our h, our rook is on a great square already. So we're going to go ahead and leave that there. From here, black is going to move. Obviously, his only chance is to come and attack our rook. And right away, we're just going to move our rook so that he can't come any closer. So we're going to go ahead and bring our rook to g8. It doesn't matter if you do it in a couple moves. It's not going to make a big difference. I'm going to go ahead and get it out of harm's way because now if he tries to come back and come to our rook, let's say to h5, then we can simply move to h8 and it'll be checkmate because that's the situation that we want. So he's probably not going to do that. You'll probably see the black king run away. And then we can simply start marching our king down the board chasing him. If he ever moves back, again, we can just move our rook to h8. It's going to be checkmate. But it's going to be checkmate eventually anyway. So black continues to move back down the board. We continue marching. He moves to h1. And from here, we can simply move our king to f2, and then his only move is to move back to h2, and we can simply move rook to h8 checkmate. So this is the easy way to checkmate a king with your king and rook. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Thanks for watching the video. I'll see you guys next time. Hey, everyone. This is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com, and I wanted to spend a few videos talking about some common end games that you'll see. I know we have a lot of people that watch the videos. Some are very good. Some are just beginning, so I wanted to take a minute to go over some of the beginner in games that a lot of people are familiar with, but some may not be. So today we're going to be talking about the king and queen in game, and a lot of times it's going to derive from just a king and pawn in game. Obviously, when you promote your pawn to a queen, it becomes a king and queen in game. So I want to take a look at just the easiest way I think to always remember how to checkmate with a king and a queen so we'll go ahead and get into it your key concept that you always want to think of is you just want to always limit the spaces that your opponent's king can go and then you just want to gradually move down the board limiting the spaces he can move and then from there it's going to be easy win so we'll go ahead and take a look at what that is going to look like on the chessboard from here it's black's move and he's going to move his king to e4 and we're going to bring our queen and we're going to go ahead and bring it to 
B5, and you can already see he can't come past this fifth rank, and so already the black king is limited to the first four ranks right here. So the black king is going to move. If he ever does move down one rank, as you'll see here, let's say the king moves to E3, then we are simply going to move our queen down, and here we'll say queen to C4, and again, we've already limited the space even more. He can't come past the fourth rank now because of our queen. So we're limiting to the first three ranks now. Now, if black decides now to move horizontally along the third rank, we can just chase him down. Obviously, he can't come past the E3 square, so he can't come over here because of our queen. So he's going to continue to march down the board. We're going to continue to follow. We're going to continue to follow. And now we've taken his one square that he would like to go to, going horizontally. Now he's going to be forced to go to the second rank. Obviously, he can't go to H2 because our queen. So he's going to be forced to go to G2. And from here, just like I said before, we're simply going to bring our queen to the third rank. And now we're limiting him to the first two ranks. Now from here, he has a decision. He can go horizontally and do the same thing, or he can go down to the first rank. If he comes down to the first rank, like we said before, once he comes down to rank, we're going to move our queen down to the second rank, and we've limited him to the first rank. Now, obviously, he can only move on the F1, G1, and H1 squares because of our queen. He can't come past this E1, but he is limited to the, the first rank here. So from here, all, his only move here is G1. So when he moves G1, we continue to bring our queen here. And now all the black king can do is just move back and forth between G1 and H1. We don't want to move our queen any farther because it'll be stalemate. But now we can simply leave our queen where it is. The black king is completely helpless. He's just going to move back and forth. And now we can bring our king into the action. The black king is going to move back and forth. We get our king into the mix. And then once our queen is, excuse me, our king is in the mix, we can simply bring our queen easy checkmate. So, hope you guys enjoyed. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and look out for more videos in the future. Thanks for watching, guys. Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be going over one of the most famous and most common end games that you'll see, and that's the Philidor position. Rook and pawn in game versus a rook in game, very common. So, what you're about to see is very, very important for any chess repertoire, for anyone that plays a lot of chess, because you may reach this critical juncture in a chess game where sometimes it's not always about winning. In this case, black is down in material. Sometimes it's just saving face and drawing a game. Drawing is much better than losing, and so many times, especially if you're playing as black, getting a draw is not a bad thing. Some of the, the best grandmasters around, when they play black, they're actually trying to go for a draw. So definitely don't feel bad, uh, especially if you reach this position and you know you're not going to win, instead of just throwing it away and saying, you know what, I'm down in material, I'm black, I can't win anyway, go for the draw. Sometimes pulling out a draw is just as impressive sometimes as pulling out a win. So in this position, it's black's play. Obviously, we can't really do a whole lot with our black king here on E8. Uh, really, if you can look at white's position, his really strongest attribute is this pawn here on e5. He really wants to push this pawn again to the 8th rank and promote that to a piece, more than likely the queen. And in this, and if you were to do that, then black is going to lose. Now, if you've seen the video on the past pawn for the pawn structures, you know that pawns need to be pushed. So white is going to be trying to push that pawn as much as he can. Also, if you saw that video, you know that the one thing you want to do to stop that is you need to block off the pawn from pushing forward. So first thing we need to do in the Philidor position is we need to put our rook so that we can start to block off this pawn and this king together. Again, this pawn really does nothing if the king is not next to it. So we really want to be able to block off this sixth rank so that the king and the pawn just can't push up the board as they please. And we'll do that with rook to g6. Again, really eyeing down on this sixth rank, really trying to limit what white can do here. Now, obviously, white does have a few options. He can get his pawn into the game. He can play pawn to e6. He could always bring his rook to a1, or excuse me, a8, which again, he's just going to move back and forth. 
we can come to e7. He can now come to a7 again. Not a lot's going on here. Obviously, from here, you want to, he would not want to get his pawn involved into the game because then we would just take it right away. So um, it's not going to do a whole lot for him if he just tries to continuously check us because, again, we can just go back and forth, back and forth. Lastly, he can't really bring his king into the action because, again, we have limited the squares on the sixth rank for him to go to. So um, one of the other options that he has is to bring his pawn to e6. And this is really where the Philidor position... Um, you know, take shape, because this is really what we want them to do. Once he plays e6 and that pawn is advanced past the king, then we can really come down and start to check. Now, before I go ahead and get in this, I want to talk about what happens if we don't move our rook to this g6 square right away. So at the beginning of the game, we were here, here on g1, and so many times people look at this position and they say, you know what, first thing I need to do, I, I need to just start checking the white king. I don't know why, but the uh, best way to save this game for me to draw is just to go ahead and check the king. So we can draw, or excuse me, we can try to draw by coming to d1, but at any time the white king can come to e6. Very important square here, if you remember this later on, this e6 square. And then what can black do? He really can't do anything, and the next move, white has a8 checkmate. So we really have to pay attention to that and at the same time it's going to be really hard for us to stop white now um, if we try to come to you know d8 then white can now bring his king if he wants to he can maneuver it away he can really start to start to push his pawn which is what we don't want so this e6 square is a very very important square for white as he tries to push forward. So, so we can tell from this position that d1 is not going to cut it, even though so many times people try to play aggressive, try to right away check the king. Right now, we really want to take this square away, this e6 square. And so that's exactly what this pawn move does. If we come to g6 and the pawn comes to e6, as soon as we see this, we know that's fantastic. We're going to come back to g1 and now we can start to check. Now in this position, white does ha have a lot of different options. Obviously, one, he can try to push his king forward. He can try to improve the position of his rook, which you may see he may bring his rook over to h7. He could, if he wanted to, even try to push his pawn forward to e7. All of these are not going to work. We'll kind of look at him here just for formality's sake. If he tries to bring his king to d6, we can now just start the barrage of checks. Again, as, as we talked about before, in the earlier position why the checks didn't work right away is because he could always put his king in front of his pawn. In this position, he can't do that. Our king is kind of blocking that square off from him, so he needs to, again, protect this pawn here on e6, so if he comes back to e5, then we can just continue checking him all day long. He can come to f5. We can check him. If he ever starts to you know, move here to g4, then we can come back, we can check him, or we can come to e1, attacking the pawn here, and he, he's really going to have to move back to try to protect this pawn, or we can just take it right away. So, as we can see, if he moves his king straight up, that's not going to work for him. Also, he could try to move his pawn to e7. This is not going to work for the same reasoning. We can just come to d1 and just start to really attack this king here on d5. Again, doesn't really matter where he moves. We're just going to continue to check him all day long. If he ever does try to move away, then again we can come down to e1 and attack this pawn here on e7. Anytime the, the rook comes to a8 then our king's just going to take this pawn here on e7. So uh, this is also not going to work for, for white. And then also if he tries, if we come down to g1 and he tries to improve his position, again, he really needs to maintain this seventh rank. If he doesn't maintain the seventh rank, our king at any time can come to the seventh rank and then just kind of dance around the board. This is not really what he wants. He, kinds of, he wants to pretty much maintain control of the seventh rank, but again, he could come to the eighth rank, try to push us away, but now again, we're just going to be dancing back and forth. He could come to a7, you know, and come back and forth. So let's say he tries to improve his position and he plays rook to h7. Again, now we can come to rook to d1, and we're pretty much just chasing the king away. Again, very, very important. The square that he ran to before, this e6 square, very important in 
this position, he can no longer go there because his pawn is there. So he can't come to d6 because, again, we have the d file. He can come to e5, and then we're just going to check him over and over. But again, there's nothing that he can do to stop us, and at the same time, he's not going to be able to promote this pawn. So anytime he tries to do anything out of the box, then we can really just check him all day long, and there's nothing he can do. So in this position, although the pawn is only two squares away from being promoted to a queen, and even though white is up in material, if black plays correctly, it's going to be a drawn game. And it's a beautiful, beautifully drawn game because black knew exactly what he was doing, and he played to precision, and it was a tactical game, and it ended in a draw. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you ever do see yourself in this position, hopefully the game ends in a draw and you don't lose. So hopefully you guys enjoy this video, and I'll see you all in the next video. So then we're going to look at the knight. We're going to see how the knight moves and how we can better play the knight in our games and get the best use out of it. Now the knight moves, he moves basically in an L. It's either a 1, 2, or a 2, 1. And we'll take a look at, let's say in this example, let's look at all the squares that the knight can move to. For this square, it depends on how you look at it. He can move 1, 2, and then one over, or he can move one and then two over. Basically, he's going to move one and then two, or two and then one. Doesn't have to, doesn't matter how you look at it. Keep in mind that the knight is the only piece in chess that can hop over pieces. So even if we have pawns everywhere, let's take a look at an example where we have pawns completely surrounding the knight. He can still move. He can still move to c2, he can still move to b3, he can hop over pieces, and he's the only piece that can do that, which is a huge benefit to having the knight. And that's why the knight, even though he can't move as much as the bishop, is still worth three points in a chess game, because of his ability to move over pieces. Now, as we saw before, all the different squares that a knight can move if he's in the middle. Now, let's take a look at if the knight is on, let's say... Let's put him on A4. Now let's look at all the different moves he can move. As you can see, as he gets on the rim, there's a limited number of squares he can move to. We've cut his moves down significantly. He can now move only four squares. We have B6, we have C5, C3, B2. Now let's put him in the corner here, and we'll see that we even minimize that even more. So let's say a knight in a1. Now he only has two moves. He can move to b3 or he can move to c2. So hopefully you can tell a knight in the middle is much, much better than a knight on the side. So a lot of times, especially when you develop your knights early on, you want to make sure you're going towards the center. And in the beginning of the game, you want to make a move like f3. You don't want to make a move like h3. This isn't very good. You don't want to put your knight on the on the edge if you don't have to. You want to let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. As you can see, we're even in material. We have the same number of pawns and the same number of minor pieces. The white is a lot better here. Remember, we said that if bishops are blocked in by their own pawns, they can't really move. And even though a bishop is worth three points and a knight is worth three points, the knight here is much better. We can position our knight to c3, and then we can bring our knight to d5, and this is a very active square for us. We can start hopping over pieces, and we're not restricted. Black, on the other hand, has a bishop, which is the same material as our knight, but as you can tell, he's blocked in by his own, his own pawn. So bishops work really well in open games where there's not a lot of pawns, and knights work really well in closed games where pawns are blocking the structure. So in this situation, you would rather have knights. And this is one of the benefits of having a knight in a game, is if it's a closed structure like this, where even a queen may not be able to penetrate this, but a knight, since he can hop over pieces, he can. So knights are definitely very good in the right situation. So this is how the knight moves. This is how you should look for in a game if the knight is good or not. Because, again, if it's an open game, it's not going to be as valuable as a bishop, but you do want to have center control with your knight at all times, and you would like to have it in a closed game. So hopefully this helped. Use it in your own chess game. Thanks for Hey, everyone. Watching. This is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com, and today we're going to be starting a very important series, one that I think you're going to want to watch all the 
videos in the series. And it's going to be a series on chess in-game strategy and tactics. We talk a lot about opening theory and middle game theory, strategy and tactics. But if you don't have a strong in-game, you're not going to be a good chess player. So I want to take some time and make some good videos on chess in-game strategy and tactics. And today we're going to be looking at minor pieces. And minor pieces have some similarities to the middle game in the end game, but they also have some key differences. So today I want to touch on the similarities that you need to think about with your minor pieces, but also some very distinct differences when you approach the end games, how your minor pieces are going to differ than you would when looking at the middle game. So the first thing we want to take a look at is the bishops. And bishops, as we've talked about in other videos, reign supreme in open games. If you haven't watched the video on open and closed positions, you may want to take a look at that. But this is an open position here, and bishops do much better in open positions. They can they have a lot of room to move around, and they can reach their fullest potential. In a closed game where pawns have fixed positions in the middle and the bishops are blocked off, the bishops really don't have as much potential as knights. If we look at knights in a closed position, you can see that they can knights can hop over pieces. So they can control the entire board even if the pawns are fixed in the middle. Where the bishops, if you can imagine, the bishops can't move anywhere if the middle of the board is fixed with pawns. Now these are some key similarities between the middle and the end game. Bishops are going to reign supreme in open games and knights are going to reign supreme in closed games. Another similarity in the middle and end game is that two knights really don't work as well together as two bishops. Two knights really control the same squares. They do the same thing, and two knights together are not nearly as powerful as two bishops. Two bishops, although they move the same, they control different color squares. So if you have a light square bishop and a dark square bishop, they can control the entire board fairly quickly because they have such a long range of motion and they control different squares. So if you have the option of having two bishops or two knights, you definitely want to choose two bishops. Now with that said, a bishop and a knight is still very powerful because they do completely different things. And that's pretty much where minor pieces with the similarities to the middle game end. There's a lot of differences with the middle game and the end game, and that's what I really want to focus on today. One of the big differences that you want to take a look at when you approach the middle game compared to the end game is how the pawn structures affect your minor pieces compared to the end game. If you take a look at the middle game, it's usually common to use your pawns to block off your opponent's bishops. In this case, black is using his pawns to barricade this light square bishop for white so that white cannot use this bishop to its full effect. As you can see, black has all its pawns on these light squares and this light square bishop can't go anywhere because he's blocked in by all these pawns. In the end game, it's a little bit different, and we're going to take a look at that here. In this end game, as you can tell, you instead don't want to place your pawns on the same color as your opponent's bishop. In this case, if you look at it, black has his pawns on light squares, and white has his pawns on the dark squares. And as you can see here, white is able to attack all the pawns from black. But black is unable to attack any of the pawns from white. And this is a key difference. In the middle game, you want to have your pawns on the same color as your opponent's bishops, where in the end game, you really like to have your pawns on the opposite color of your opponent's bishop. So in this case, white's going to have a much better game because he can attack all the pawns from black, but black in turn cannot attack any of the pawns from white. So in this situation, as you can see, white has a much better game because there's nothing black can really do to attack any of the pawns. He can't really put much pressure. So in this situation, this black bishop is almost worthless. Yes, he can take away some squares from our king moving, but this bishop for white is going to be much more potent, and he can attack all these different pawns and force black to make a lot of different moves. So this is one of the key things that you want to take a look at. We're going to take a look at an example of how you can use this in your end game when you approach different situations. Let's go ahead and take a look at this example. and It's a pretty common end game. As you'll see, both sides have four pawns, both sides have a bishop on the dark square, and both sides have their king centralized. You always want to centralize your king in the end game because it becomes a very valuable asset that you can use. And he actually is a very, very powerful piece in the end game. 
But it's White's move, and go ahead and think about the theme that we just talked about, and think about what you think would be the best move for White. Well, let's go ahead and talk about it before I show you the move. But if you can see, both sides have a bishop, and they're both on the dark square. And White would really like his pawns to be on the light squares, and his opponents to be on the dark squares. In the middle game, it's a little bit different, as we talked about, but in the end game, you don't want to block your own bishop off from your pawns, and you want to be able to attack your opponent's pawns. So in this scenario, the best move for white is pawn to a4. And what this does is it solidifies the light squares for the pawns from white. White's bishop is no longer trapped in by his own pawns, and he can attack freely all the pawns from black. Black, in turn, is only going to be able to attack his own pawn, and he's not going to be able to attack the pawns from white. White's next move, if he wants to, can bring his pawn, his next pawn to b3, and there's nothing black can do. A lot of times when I approach an endgame, and it's a bishop endgame, I always like to look at, can I put all my pawns on a different color than my opponent's bishop? And if I can, I know that I usually have a winning endgame. There may be a few other factors depending on where the kings are, where the pawns are, if the pawns are close to promotion, but if they're in the middle and the kings are centralized, as long as I know I can put my pawns on a different color than my opponent's bishop, I know that his bishop is completely taken out of the game. And that's just another advantage that I can take going into the end game. So you always want to look at this when you approach a bishop end game, is how you evaluate your pawn structure and how you can use that pawn structure to help you with your bishops compared to how you would look at it in the middle game. So let's go and take a look at a few more things that are different in the end game than the middle game. Let's take a look at this example here and think about which side is better in this spot. And actually, white's better because he has a bishop. But his bishop is good because there's pawns on both sides of the board. In the end game, if you have pawns on both sides of the board, you prefer a bishop because he can get to both sides very quickly. A lot of times in the end game, the position is going to be open, so you don't want to just look at open, but you want to look at where the pawns are. The bishop can get to both sides, where although the knight can control very critical squares, it's going to be very hard for him to get back and forth from both sides of the board very quickly. But if you look at, if we take away these pawns from the A file, black is actually better off. This knight, although he can't get to both sides of the board, he doesn't need to. He can control all the critical squares he needs to on these two files, on the G and the H file, where the bishop, although he can move around the board freely, he's not going to be able to control all the critical squares that the knight is. So if you have pawns on both sides of the board in the end game, bishops are going to fare better. Where if pawns are on only one side of the board, knights are actually going to fare better. So these are a few of the things, some of the differences that you will see in the end game from other parts of the game. Hopefully you've enjoyed some of the other videos that are going to be coming up in the in-game strategy and tactics lessons are going to be great. So if you haven't already, please subscribe. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next video. Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the testwebsite.com, and today we're going to be continuing our study on the in-game. We're going to be looking at when you should play for a draw. So many times, if you were to study a GM game, anytime they go down any significant amount of material, one, two, or even a whole point in chess, they just give up on the spot. But really, if you're not a GM, I highly recommend you don't just give up. I highly recommend that you instead play for a draw. And so we're going to look at a few instances that you should keep in the back of your head where you should be thinking about playing for the draw, even if you have a losing game. So in this case, if you look at right here and it's Black's move, if Black tries to move like Queen to D2, trying to eye down on this g2 square, trying to checkmate the king. As you can see, black has a decisive advantage up an entire piece, this rook here on a2. But what black has missed, and what a lot of players miss, is a perpetual check that white can do. Perpetual check meaning that white can continue to check and check the king, and there's nothing that black can do to improve the game. And most players from that position just agree upon a draw because the game's going to go on forever just checking and checking. So from here, black has missed the move queen to c8. He can't bring his queen back to d8 because then white can just take on d8 and now black's going to lose. Black doesn't want to lose this game, so he's going to have to move his king. From here, the queen can come down to f5, and either the king can go back if he moves his king back to g8 or h8, doesn't matter, 
our queen can now come back to c8. If instead he moves his king to h7 and we move our queen back to f5, let's try. Let's say he tries to move his pawn to g6. Now we can capture this pawn on f7, and then the king and the queen are just going to continue to go back and forth. And this is perpetual check. If you perpetual check in the rule books, it's not a draw, but most players after perpetual check will just agree on a draw, and that's usually what happens. But as you can see here, white's down a lot in material, but at the same time, black left him an opportunity to have perpetual check. And especially this happens if you have a queen. Anytime you have a queen, I like to look for a perpetual check. So many players if they go down to material they try to just throw the entire kitchen sink at your opponent sacrificing pieces off the wall trying for an extravagant attack when instead a lot of times if you go down and you know you don't have a good chance to win I try to set up a perpetual trek I try to use the pieces that I have to try to expose the king so that I can perpetual check and use and get a draw out of the game and I think this is a lot more beneficial than just throwing all your pieces away and then losing the game pretty easy. So we're going to take a look at another example of how perpetual check works in the end game. In our next examples, we can see white has a huge advantage. Again, up an entire rook. But if it's black's move, take a minute and see if you can find the perpetual check. And it's not that hard, but hopefully you came up with queen to b4. And the king is going to have to move one two places. He's going to move, well, three places. A2, A1, or C1. But either way, the queen can have perpetual check. If he moves to A1, we can come to A4. If he comes back to B1, we can come to B4. If he ever tries to come to C1, then we can bring our queen to A3. He can't get out of these checks. We can continue to check him all day long. And there's no way that he can get out of this. So this is a simple way where if we have a queen we should always be looking especially for perpetual check if we're down a lot of material where a lot of players will try some fancy exchange and end up losing the game pretty easily the next thing I want to talk about is stalemate and stalemate as we're going to see can be one of the most effective ways to tie a game in the end game stalemate is a position where the king cannot move but he's not in check and this is a drawn game and a lot of people don't win their games because they allow their opponent's king to be in stalemate. And uh, there's a lot of people who are looking to stalemate your own king. In this position here, this is a famous game where it's black's move, and black thought it'd be wise to push his pawn up the board. He saw that if pawn to b2, and the rook captured on b2, then the rook could come to h2, and after the king moved, he could take this rook on b2 and have an easy end game. But what Black did not see is that after he came down to h2, the king could come to f3, and after the rook captures on b2, this is a drawn game. This is stalemate. The king cannot move anywhere, but at the same time, he's not in check. So this is a drawn game. So Black had a decisive game winning, but he ended up drawing the game because of stalemate. So there's a lot of times in chess where you should look to stalemate your own king so that you can draw and not lose a game.